Was Alistair Crowley a British spy? Crowley became infamous, called the wickedest man in the world by Britain's tabloid press, not just because he drove many of his wives insane, drugged his audiences at public occult rituals, or conducted sex rites at his notorious villa in Italy, but because the British Crowley took a pro-German stance during the First World War. Falsely claiming to be an Irishman, he wrote anti-British propaganda for the German newspaper The Fatherland, and he burned papers he claimed were his passport at the Statue of Liberty. He even professed to have had a hand in the disastrous sinking of the Lusitania at the hands of a German U-boat. But if you ask Crowley, he did all of this on behalf of the Allies in the name of His Majesty's Secret Service. Today, we tag along with the Great Beast as Alistair Crowley goes to war. James Bond, Alistair Crowley. Same guy. I haven't done that in a while. You can bring that back. Yeah, but you have to okay. do it in like a jazzy, like James, oh, yeah, James Bond, Bond spa, style. like spy way. Um, like a little. That's not metal. Nah, that's jazz. Nah, nah, <laughs> it's jazz. Nah, nah, it's not metal. Nah, nah, nah. I don't know. Like <laughs> it's not the same. It's a completely different riff. Then if I do that. Okay. Well, it's little, not. Lil Nas is mixing musical genres. You can try. What? Okay. We'll see what happens. <laughs> Speaking of James Bond, though, we are going to get to James Bond author Ian Fleming. He was all over the place. He mm. and Aleister Crowley were friends. And, by the way, he, I believe, had a house right here on Maryland's yeah. Eastern Shore. Yeah. So, lots of connections here today. My name is Rob C. Thompson. I am the supreme hierophant of our secret order of alchemical actors and a doctor of occult theory and practice. Sure. Yep. Uh... <laughs> I'm <laughs> joined, as usual, by Olivia Litteral, Crowley fan extraordinaire. Crowley fan. Oh, pardon, I'm pardon me. I'm very distinctly a Crowley <laughs> fan. Thank you. Her sister Bree is back because black magic is on the horizon. Hell yeah. And she brought John Cook with her. Of course I did. Oh, hi. Whose official title is Sylph of the Air. I just want our listeners to be reminded. Which really does make more sense now that I think about mm -hmm. it, because Gemini is an air sign, and yeah, John yeah, is yeah. a Gemini. You guys and your okay. <laughs> astrology. We're literally on an occult podcast. Yeah, I don't know why you're judging us for it. <laughs> we, the members of, of the, the Secret, Secret Order, Order of, of Alchemical, Alchemical Actors, do to solemnly commit ourselves to a full and honest telling of the history of the occult as far as we know it. <laughs> you almost messed up. Because I got out of breath. <laughs> <laughs> it is. It's a lot. It's a mouthful. All right, breathe. let's get to no. those three plugs, shall we? Plug, plug, plug! First, uh, we haven't done this in a little while, but it would help uh, before you get into this episode, if you're a brand new listener, if you haven't listened to our earlier Crowley episodes, we did a, a series yeah. of a two-part series in our Black Magic collection. Satanic. It's collection number four, Something. series number four, yeah. season four. I don't know what we're calling these. Uh, so the fourth, go to number four, four point the things. The fourth collection. Look for that Alistair Crowley. Classy, right? uh, <laughs> second, uh, our newest patrons, we have Ayla Stout, who uh, we befriended on uh, Castbox. Ayla Stout. Ayla. Ayla. You know her? No. Good. I just <laughs> clarifying her name. Yeah, I assume she's name. from other parts of the world than Maryland's Eastern Shore. Also, Lucy. Thank you, Lucy, for joining us. Oh, Lucy. Finally, uh, subscribe and review. Yeah. Just do that. Just we got some it. A pluses. Oh, we got it. We got to save that for the oh, order of oh, confessors. Uh, I know you're very excited about I that am. A plus because you specifically requested it. Was it was but... an unexpected turn of events. <laughs> let's get down to Alistair Crowley. Let's not make the people wait yeah, any longer. Yeah. Regular listeners have already had a couple of episodes, as we mentioned, of Crowley's hijinks and misadventures. But now, for those of you who heard my warning that you should go back, and they're like, I don't want to do that. I want to hear about how he goes to war. Uh, we're gonna give you do you a little favor here. Uh, if you if you don't know much about Aleister Crowley, I'll tell you somebody who does know something about Aleister Crowley. I speak, of course, of J. Gordon Melton. He is the author of the Biographical Dictionary of American Cult and Sect Leaders. Oh, that book! Yes. Oh, God, that book is <laughs> mm, a plus. And it was the focus of our instantly classical segment that we did just a few episodes back on Alice Bailey, and it has returned in a segment we call. A moment with the Biographical Dictionary by J. Gordon Melton. This is my new favorite thing. <laughs> now, I know that some of you are thinking, but Rob, Aleister Crowley is British, not American. 
Let me tell you a little something about J. Gordon Melton. This is a man, a scholar, an iconoclast, who will not allow himself to be prejudiced by insignificant details, like the home country of a cult and or sect leader. <laughs> Crowley spent a fair amount of time in America and organized cults and or sects during his time in the colonies. And so he deserves his time in the limelight of the Biographical Dictionary of American Cult and Sect Leaders. And that brings us, after a wait of about two episodes, back by popular demand to the second part in what we all hope will be a long-running series. Let's get down to it. Alistair Crowley was born in Warwickshire, England on the 12th of October, 1875. He was the son of a fundamentalist preacher and his mother gave him the name The Beast for the way he rebelled against his strict upbringing. He dabbled in poetry and magic in college passions that he would maintain throughout his life. And in 1898, he joined the Hermetic Order of the Golden Dawn, prompted by friend George Cecil Jones. When a fissure developed within the order, Crowley exacerbated it, splintering the group, and then left, making his first visit to the US. He married Rose Edith Kelly in August 1903, and they traveled together to Cairo, Egypt, where he was con contacted by the spirit Ivos and received the revelations that would become his Book of the Law, including the Law of Thelema, Do what thou wilt shall be the whole of the law. He founded his own magical order, Argentium Astrum, or Silver Star, but in 1912 he turned away from the group when Theodor Royce inducted him into the German order Templi Orientis. The OTO practiced a form of sex magic first advocated by American occultist Pascal Beverly Randolph, featured in our very first series, yep. in fact our very first episode. Throwing it back. In 1914, Crowley traveled to America, where he spent the war years leaving in 1919 to found the Abbey of Thelema in Sicily. And that's a moment with the Biographical Dictionary of American Cult and Sect Leaders. Oh, that was a, yeah, that was a moment. Brief. That was a moment. Yeah. Well, most of our listeners, I think, know, know their, their Crowley bio, but we don't want to leave anybody in the cold here before we dive into World War I. Because yes. that's <sighs> enough, right? Hmm. In his book, Secret Agent 666, Richard B. Spence makes an often circumstantial but nonetheless fascinating case that Aleister Crowley was a secret agent for the British military. Intelligence agents were not the same as intelligence officers. Officers were publicly identified with their role, whereas agents conducted their work entirely in secret and were paid on the sly and often denied by their bosses. This makes it tricky to prove that Crowley was an agent because the people he worked for would consistently deny that he did any spying for them, and that's exactly what they would say if he was spying for them. That's like Spy 101, right? <laughs> yeah. Secret Agency 101. Right, and then you're stuck. No one ever knows that yeah. you're a spy. You can never prove it it's or disprove it. a secret for a reason. Yep. It's reason. like the Rosicrucians. <laughs> right. There might not even be records of it because they wouldn't want anybody to know. Oh. At the turn of the century, the British intelligence agencies MI5 and MI6 hadn't been created yet, and espionage was carried out by the War Office and the Admiralty, often through embassies across the globe. Early on, Crowley seems to have coveted the spy's life. He learned Russian and adopted one of many aliases he would take on throughout his life. Count Vladimir Zvarev. Hmm. That's not very... It's not uh, a Russian under... name, also. It's not like... really... It's not low key at all. Yeah, well, he was a he was pretty high key. Oh yeah, yeah. yeah that's whatever. what I love about That's why the montage though. happened in my head. <laughs> he did his spying in plain sight. He wanted to, these like loud, outlandish characters. It's what better way man. to spy? <laughs> <laughs> well, he claimed he'd done this to disguise his occult activity from his family. So that's so it was like the first time he created this name. He was like, I just didn't want people to know I was an occultist because you know dad's a fundamentalist and everyone's yeah. super rich back home. In Crowley's youth, the British Empire had stretched into India and the two world powers were competing for territory in roughly the same region. Later, they would enjoy a tense alliance during the First and Second World Wars. In 1913, he brought the violin playing Scarlet Woman, Leila Waddell, to the Aquarium Theater in Moscow to perform with their band of half-naked, ragged, ragtime girls. Did you say Aquarium Theater? The Aquarium Theater, where you so go like to see ragged girls. Stage with fish tank behind well, I don't think you? there were any there wasn't a mermaid act this was a ragtime act and they were ragged. where's the aquarium part where's, where's just these half naked fish? girls playing violins I thought there would be fish behind if they're dressed girls. as fish that's fine but they're not 
That's still not an aquarium. But that would mean every act that they booked would have to be a fish act. I'd be fine with that. (laughs) But if they had fish just in a tank, then they wouldn't... Maybe it's a Russian thing. I don't don't think think so. so. (laughs) His Russian theatrical agent for this tour was Mikhail Likiardopoulos. (laughs) <laughs> well, that's yeah, I practiced that one last night. I bet you can. Yeah. Uh, this was a man who would go on to run Britain's propaganda department in Moscow during the war. Strange coincidence. Crowley's Russian activities are just one instance of there being considerable volumes of secret spy smoke around the beast, while the fire remains in true secret spy fashion. Elusive. Was was very, I, I was very confused poetic. when you said smoke. I, yeah, I thought there was smoke. actually... And then you went to fire, and I was like, wait... Smoke is a metaphor. Yeah, I it was it. convoluted. Crowley just so happened to be in Mexico, thanks, <laughs> <laughs> when the country's leader, Porfirio Diaz, grand master of the same Masonic order that Crowley belonged to, oh. yeah, helped to broker a deal giving British entrepreneur Wheatman Pearson a controlling interest in Mexican petroleum. You follow that? So Crowley arrives in Mexico, and suddenly there's this deal being brokered between the president of Mexico and this uh, British guy. At the time, the British Admiralty was actively seeking to replace coal with oil as the fossil fuel powering its mighty fleet. So the British Navy had an interest in getting a British guy to control Mexican oil. Oh, okay. And Crowley just so happens to pop into Mexico when all this is going down, and he just so happens to be in the exact same Masonic order mm-hmm. as the president of Mexico. All right. So, again, it's, like, circumstantial. Mm-hmm. There's no, like, hard proof. But it's a lot of circumstance. It's like... a lot of secret spy smoke, Brianna. Ooh. That it was it was just that convoluted was very, because of this. Yeah. <laughs> it was just because there was a lot of words in that metaphor that didn't relate to fire or smoke. <laughs> it was a journey. Yeah. In Shanghai, where he used tarot cards to locate a packet of missing Russian rubles to aid a local British postmaster. What the hell did he I wouldn't do know that, that story. <laughs> I mean, that's, there it is. It's is all that, right there for the you. Whole story. I'm just you trying to think cards. of how I would do that. Like, <laughs> I would just get mad. <laughs> right? At the tarot cards? Or they would not help me identify no. a location of Well, you're not Alistair Crowley. <laughs> would be like, tower, and I'd be like, I'm never finding, I'm never finding I this. I think they're north. I'm never finding this people. <laughs> <laughs> Go up. But don't stay up there. While he spoke of this episode in veiled terms in his confessions, it suggests his involvement in tracking the movement of Russian currency through China on behalf of British intelligence. Got me? So he's tracking down Russian rubles because the British are like, because they're like in China selling opium and stuff. What are, what are, what are the Russians up to? So again, smoky, smoky. No fire. When the First World War broke out, Crowley came to America disembarking from the ill-fated Lusitania on Halloween Day 1914. Lusitania, spoiler alert, will sink. Not on today. Halloween Day, he yeah, of course. got off of it? He's of course. so, like, people <laughs> wonder why I love him, and this is why. Like, he's so extra. I love him more after this, but we'll, we'll get to the rest of this case. I don't love him yet, oh, officially. I'm there. He traveled under another pseudonym, Edward Alexander Crowley, comma, Irishman. <laughs> still still less suspicious. I think that's more suspicious. It's so, like, for one, still keeps his last name and then adds Irishman to it. Like, that's like... Yeah, and Alexander Crowley's not very far off, that's really. That's like asking... You can't get the ethnicity. You won't... That's you like won't asking to be like, wow, why do you have to specify that he was an Irishman? In his confessions, he claimed that he'd arrived penniless in the States. But, in fact, he was better off than that. He had 50 pounds, or about $5,000 in today's money, in his pocket and stayed at the posh St. Regis Hotel in New York. A deal with a rare bookseller would net him another 600 bucks to live on. Crowley would focus on two of the British Empire's enemies while in the U.S. The first were Irishmen, attempting to broker a deal with the Germans to secure Ireland's independence from the crown. Got it? So that's why he had to be like, I am an Irishman. Yeah. 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 That makes him look like he's on the side of the axis of evil. Instead of Count Dracula. It's still... The German axis. (laughs) Count Dracula is only for Russians. Right. Russians love the Count. Right. They're all on board Germans love Irishmen because the Irish are actively, like, colluding with them. His title just is... Irish. It's comma. And the Irish <laughs> only need to see Irishmen in their lives. They don't even look Yeah, of course. You must be an Irishman because it says so right here. Yes. Anyway. 
So, uh, there are these Irishmen, and they're colluding with the Germans to try to get their independence from England, which has got its thumb squarely on Ireland's neck. The second group were German-Americans, who maintained a sentimental and political connection to their ancestral home, and were actively working on behalf of the Kaiser to keep the Americans out of the Great War. So we got these two groups in the United States working for the Allied powers. Crowley claimed to have found his way into the center of Germany's propaganda machine in America by accident. While riding on a bus in New York, he met a man named O'Brien, in quotation marks. That's very Dr- Irish. O'Brien, Pseudonym. comma, Irishman? <laughs> yeah. Yeah. Well, that was just understood. Specifically an Irishman. O'Brien asked Crowley... O'Bri- O'Brien, comma, Mexican. I don't know. <laughs> Brazilian. O'Brien, I guess it's possible. But no, he's an Irishman, John. You're right. Thank you. O'Brien asked if Crowley was in favor of a square deal for the Germans. Hint, hint. Wink, wink. Nudge, nudge. And Crowley lied and said that he was which promptly landed him straight in the office of the Fatherland, an American newspaper with a distinctly pro-German bent. According to Spence, Crowley's actual contact was an Irishman named Anthony J. Brogan. Not O'Brien. The name Crowley made up. And this guy was the publisher for The Irish American, which was later acquired by The Fatherland. The editor at The Fatherland was George Sylvester Vierick. Vierick had been born in Munich and moved to America with his parents after his father got out of being jailed for his socialist leanings. He was an only child with eclectic interests, including classic mythology, poetry, and sexology. Oh, he was going to be... (laughs) Crowley's best friend. (laughs) He was also a bisexual, even more. Yep, yep. They're best friends. With a fondness for orgies, still... And the author of the novel, The House of the Vampire. It's best friends. That's best friends for life. (laughs) Count Dracula? (laughs) Yeah. Now, the plot of this involved the title character engaging in psychic rather than literal blood sucking, and it had strong homoerotic undercurrents. So, this German guy, this German-American, Virek, accepted Crowley as an authentic black magician, because they're like brothers from another mother, and immediately began publishing his work in the fatherland. He would go on to make Crowley the editor of his literary journal, The International. Like, no wonder he felt so verified by himself. Right? Like, you <laughs> know what I mean? He would just be doing something, like, he's just casually, you know, doing his job, all and then the all bus. of a sudden he just Things gets... pretty much just would work out. Yeah, it was like they like... were handed to him <laughs> well, without him asking. It. Like, not only is he on the bus, but he's on the bus thinking to himself... Gee, I wonder how I can get inside the German propaganda right? machine. And, and then O'Brien <laughs> just happens to walk up to him, an Irishman. Of all things. And like, it's like, hey. Off it goes. You want to get in on this? Yeah. Like, it does seem like there's some sort of cosmic conspiracy to put him at the center of wherever he wants to be. Apparently. He's magically controlling his, his he's taking control. On the surface, it looked like Crowley was acting the consummate devil he claimed to be by siding with the Germans against the British. Just sort of being a dick. He was writing articles on behalf of the Germans for a newspaper that advocated a German victory over Europe. But, as we said at the beginning, the story's a bit more complicated than that. The case could just as easily be made that Crowley was not consorting with the enemy and betraying his homeland, but rather working as an undercover agent. So you're going to do it for Brie. That wasn't even, na, 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 na. But it's still not even in the tune of the, da, of the riff. It's just, you're just like Batman. No, that's the, yeah. That's <laughs> what I was doing. doing Batman. That's not exactly Batman. No, but no, I was doing like a spy close. thing. <laughs> it's pretty close. I was doing like a... You just changed the sound, like the Alistair articulation of the... During Crowley's tenure, Vierick struggled to keep his paper's inner workings out of the eyes of the British Secret Service, who seemed to get their hands on his every memorandum. Strange. But Crowley's larger project was to stir up American animosity toward the Germans by publishing articles that made the Germans seem belligerent and condescending. His goal was to get America into the war on the side of the British any way he could. I worked up Vierick gradually from relatively reasonable attack on England to extravagances which achieved my object of revolting every comparatively sane human being on Earth. I proved that the Lusitania was a man of war. I dug up all the atrocities of King Leopold of Belgium. I translated atrocity not merely into military necessity, but into moral uplift. I put halos on the statue of von Hindenburg with his wooden head and his nightgown of tin tacks. But on the whole, I took few chances of letting the Germans perceive the tongue in my cheek. The Lusitania, or the Lucy, had been the subject of a series of conspiracy theories. 
The sinking of the Lusitania was the event that brought the United States into the First World War. United States President Woodrow Wilson tended in a pacifist direction and worked for over two years to keep the United States out of the war. The death of 1,959 passengers, among them many Americans, was too much for the public to stomach, and the event triggered the end of the U.S.'s neutrality. The Lusitania had been sunk by a German U-boat because the Germans believed that the Cunard Line passenger ship was carrying munitions. The cruise liner had been built with the possibility that it could be converted into an armed merchant cruiser. But the Lusitania required so much coal to run that they scuttled that plan because the ship would drain too much of the Navy's fuel reserves. So, in 1972, Colin Simpson made the argument that the British had intentionally provoked the sinking of the Lusitania. The Admiralty had not provided the ship with an escort when it reached British waters, which was the custom. So that's evidence point number one, that the British actually wanted this passenger ship, this Titanic of, 19, of you know, World War I, to go down. The ship was also uniquely vulnerable to, tor to torpedoes because of the way it had been designed and would fill with water almost instantaneously. That's just sort of bad luck, not intentional, but that, yeah, if it had been torpedoed. It wasn't going to gently go down. We could get our life rafts together. The ship would begin to list immediately, actually, and it would make it very difficult to, to deploy any lifeboats. The Admiralty knew of this weakness, but they did not pull the ship from active duty, so they also could have been like, this thing is going to go down hard, and everyone will die on it. How about we not deploy it as long as there are German submarines trying to kill people? But, no, no. let it go. Do what it has to do. Point number two in the conspiracy theory. Rumors that the Lusitania would be sunk surfaced, surfaced as early as the fall of 1914, and the Germans, as well as the American agents, were spotted aboard the ship shortly before it was torpedoed. Point number three. A warning had actually appeared in the New York papers beside an advertisement for the Lusitania's next crossing. Travelers intending to embark on the Atlantic voyage are reminded that a state of war exists between Germany and her allies and Great Britain and her allies. That the zone of war includes the waters adjacent to the British Isles. That in accordance with the formal notice given by the Imperial German government, vessels flying the flag of Great Britain or any of her allies are liable to destruction in those waters and that the travelers sailing in the war zone on the ships of Great Britain or her allies do so at their own risk. Imperial German Embassy, Washington, D.C., 22nd of April, 1915. So that came from the German Embassy. The German Embassy was warning people who were think about, thinking about traveling on the Lusitania that it might not be a good idea. Could you imagine if that happened today? <laughs> like what? How, how would that be? Like if there was like a boat that was the newest, like biggest, like the Titanic. And the there Caribbean was Viking literally cruise line. on the advertisement, it just said like... If you go out on this boat, you might sink and die from, like, torpedoes. Well, you'd just... be sitting watching daytime television, and then it'd be the Viking Cruise or whatever. Yeah. The Royal Caribbean, the Carnival Cruise Line I ad bet would people show. would still and do then, it. And then, like, like, the medical, like, disclaimers, the really quick, like, run-through that's, like, tiny <laughs> on the screen while it's, like, really being, like, spoken really quickly. It would oh, just be honey, like, let's go. Uh, warning, you may sink and die on this. <laughs> <laughs> There's a strong likelihood that you will be torpedoed and die. In instantly. the middle of the Atlantic. Just Why would people get on this boat at this time? You know? They don't read the paper. Why? I really, really want to go to England. Or they just didn't look at the disclaimer. I, I guess my point is people... made to believe a lot of things. I feel like people today, I guess my point would just do, wouldn't read it either. Yeah, you ignore yeah. that stuff. <laughs> Again, All yeah. of us think we're going to live forever. Hmm. hmm. <laughs> on the morning of the Lusitania's departure, nine telegrams arrived at the ship warning prominent passengers of the ship's potential destruction. Wait, so not only is was there an initial warning, there's nine others yes. afterwards. Yeah. So the question is not only for the passengers, but for the government. Why didn't either the British or the Americans or somebody step in and say, well, how about we not sail this ship this time? So did anyone live? Did they survive? The... I'm not sure. Uh, about 767. That's a very specific number, John. Were you ready for that question? No. You just walk around with that information everywhere you go. Yes. <laughs> he grabbed it from the collective consciousness. <laughs> okay. Surprised you haven't said that to me. Like, we talk about this stuff a lot. I you talk about the Lusitania? 
You guys woke up this morning and John turned to you and said, 767 people survived the sinking of the Lusitania. How many people Did were on it total? Do you know that, John? Slightly more than that. Ah. <laughs> Well, so 2000, like 10 people died. Roughly 2,000 died. Oh, so, so did it. Okay. Slightly, slightly more. Yeah. So did anyone, like, any of the 700-something get off that boat and be, like, pursuing? I mean, they could, I suppose. It's conceivable. Like, happened upon Like, they the found newspaper. the advertisement. <laughs> they went back to the newspaper. And they were oh, like, wow. oh. Should have read this yeah. before I got on that boat. For his part, Crowley, who had first-hand experience traveling on board the Lusitania, remember, that's how we got here on Halloween Day, could argue that there were guns aboard the cruise liner, even though there weren't. So he could be like, I traveled on the Lusitania, and there are totally guns there. You should think it, Germans. And sharing this false information went beyond propaganda. He claimed that his connections at the Fatherland had led to a seat at German strategy and policy meetings in Chicago. He, wa- he bragged a lot, though, so you never know. Mm-hmm. He warned the Germans that the greatest threat to their success was the Americans entering the war, and that the best way to keep them out was by scaring them off with a display of German might in the form of an immediate coup. This became, in Crowley's own view, the sinking of the Lusitania, which happened on the 7th of May, 1915. So he believes that he personally goaded the Germans into sinking the Lusitania. Of course he does. To keep the Americans out. I mean, the Americans didn't enter the war for another two-ish years, but this definitely set the ball rolling. His goal was in line with the government's goal, to get the Americans into the war on the side of the British against the Germans. So by that I mean the British government. He's essentially doing His Majesty's business here. On the 6th of April 1917, Crowley could claim success when, as I said, the U.S. Congress voted for a declaration of war against Austria-Hungary, inspired at least in part by Germany's actions on the high seas. So... Point number one in favor of the Crowley is a secret agent theory. He claims some responsibility for the sinking of the Lusitania, which was a fishy event historically. No pun intended? Or pun intended? A uh, bad one if it is. This is like last time I was on. Oh my yeah, gosh. Yeah, you've become the, the pun. No, it's only been two. Right now. It's only been two. <laughs> and I didn't make it. You. Two I make them, but you appreciate them. Yeah. <laughs> Yeah. <laughs> you don't like my metaphors. You do like no. my puns. Your metaphors. It was very convoluted. <laughs> I am a simple woman. <laughs> Let's move on to the Statue of Liberty, shall we? That's where I'd Speaking love to go. A simple woman. Not really. Do you know? There's a lot to do just with Just take that. her to the Statue of Liberty. I was just trying to make The Statue of Liberty joke. isn't on Ellis Island. Yeah, it's on uh, Bedloe Island. I, that blew my mind. You didn't know that? No, they always tell you, like, they as- you always associate the two. I've it's, never actually that's been. That's where the immigration center is on Ellis Island. Right, yeah, but, but you always not. hear... Do you know what I... This is like a a thing, a is Mandela it? effect, sort is of. It? I don't know if it is. I, I think you're just wrong In about school, that. Yeah, I swear to God, in incorrect. school... No. Because I know the difference. I thought it was just sitting in the water. I don't know. <laughs> I've never been there. I don't know. <laughs> they just plunked it down in the middle yeah, of it. They're like, know? all right. <laughs> To win the trust of the Germans, Crowley staged one of the most bizarre stunts of his lifetime at the Statue of Liberty. Now, I prefer to get the full report from the man himself, so we'll turn to our actor Jacob Wheatley, who is reading the role of Crowley for us today. I invited a young lady violinist who has some Irish blood in her, behind the more evident stigmata of the Ornithorn Heinkiss and the Wombat, adding to our number about four other debauched persons on the verge of delirium tremens. We went out into a motorboat before dawn on the 3rd of July to the rejected Statue of Commerce for the Suez Canal, which Americans fondly supposed to be in liberty enlightening the world. There, I read my Declaration of Independence. I threw an old envelope into the bay, pretending that it was my British passport. We hoisted the Irish flag. The violinist played the wearing of the green. The crews of the interned German ships cheered us all the way up the Hudson, probably because they estimated the degree of our intoxication with scientific precision. Finally, we went to Jack's for breakfast and home to sleep it off. The New York Times gave us three columns and Virek was distinctly friendly. Did the envelope say Crowley, comma, Irishman? <laughs> and in parentheses, passport. And in some, another parentheses, Vladimir. <laughs> <laughs> yeah, it's just like... The Count. <laughs> <laughs> Crowley, the Count, the Irishman. The spy. Irishman. Okay, a spy. <laughs> so the violinist uh, with wombat stigmata was actually Leela Waddell, which, who was one of Crowley's famous Scarlet Women we mentioned earlier. 
The Times had given him three columns because he very purposefully had brought one of their reporters along for the trip. Now here's where it gets secret agent-y. He told the New York Times that he was an Irishman and that he was a close friend of William Butler Yeats. Now, Crowley fans, right, Olivia's making a face, will recognize that name as a, a poet of the turn of the century and a pretty good one at that, and a guy who hated Aleister Crowley. I, yeah. <laughs> with that's a why, fiery what? passion. That's why I was and who little, Crowley hated as much as they hated each other. a lot of disdain. So, Yeats had famously vied with Crowley for control of the Golden Dawn. Crowley regarded him as a mortal enemy. His choice to describe Yeats as a friend, then, could have been more Crowley being Crowley. Like, sometimes he just says nonsense. To be, like, an asshole. Like, to get under Yeats' yeah. skin. <laughs> but it could also have been a signal to those who knew him that he didn't mean any of the things he was doing on Bedloe Island. Hmm. Oh, that's a pretty good code. Yeah, it like, is. Wow. Crowley yeah. said he was a friend of Yeats. And you're reading, you're like, no, that's... He's lying, and then you're like, oh, wait. He's lying. Boy, this whole like thing is a stunt. This is the most convincing thing so yeah, far to me. Really I don't know why. this one. I think This it one is feels yeah. right. Yeah. Apparently, you didn't like that old Lusitania conspiracy. No, 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 no. That was fine. That was cool. I have a lot of questions, but <laughs> that was... Whether or not he was actually lot. involved, I guess, right. might be there. But this feels, yeah. Very solid. I believe every word he said. <laughs> <laughs> Thank you, John. <laughs> Neat. Mm. It's appreciated. <laughs> He's really sorry that you weren't alive. Honestly, he, was, yeah, he, he could have used, used you. you. Oh, I'm right here. <laughs> <laughs> Apparently, Crowley had not cleared this performance with his superiors in the intelligence community. Oh. And he pleaded with them that his plan was to fully convince the German Americans of his authenticity as a disgruntled Irishman, <laughs> comma, Irishman, so that he might uh, be allowed to infiltrate Germany itself. He wants to go to the fatherland. But British intelligence would not get on board and decided that Crowley would stay in America. During the course of his performance at Lady Liberty, he had spoken out in favor of Irish independence and against the British Empire, calling it the enemy of civilization, justice, equality, freedom, and the human race. Wow. The British response to this behavior is actually further evidence that Crowley was on their payroll. During the course of the war, Parliament had passed the Defense of the Realm Act, which forbids speech against the crown and the country. Another dark occultist named Ignatius Timothy Trevich Lincoln. Oh, what a name. How <laughs> about him, yeah? He offered to spy for the British just like Crowley, but when they rejected him, he turned around and joined the Germans. He claimed to have contacted the Kaiser's agents in Holland and returned to England with what he said were German codes and he gave those to Admiral Hall, commander of the British Navy's intelligence service. Hall told Trevich Lincoln to get out of the country, either because he distrusted him or because he wanted to use him now as a double agent. He ended up in America where he began writing anti-British articles, just like Crowley, and bragging about his work as a German spy. The British were provoked by the articles, and Scotland Yard dug up an old forgery charge and demanded that the Americans arrest and extradite him. Oh. Right? Wow. That's some spy stuff. Yeah. Okay. It's bad spy stuff. No, no, but <laughs> like, I mean, like, this is, yeah. like a, this is like a spy movie now. Yeah. yeah. So, you following me, though? You, you yeah. good? All right. Yeah. So, Trebich Lincoln had either failed in his role as a double agent or was legitimately anti-British. Either way, the British were not having any of it. And the fact that Scotland Yard let Alistair Crowley alone, who was also writing anti-British propaganda for the Germans, never drug up a charge on him, never sent yeah. anyone to arrest yeah. him, never had him extradited, right? Hmm. Suggests that they knew about what he was doing and at least tacitly approved of it. John's making well, Mr. Burns fingers. <laughs> so, can confirm, Bay was a spy. Now we know. It's you see, it's very it's yeah. Yeah. Very persuasive. I feel like it has to be. Not all of the evidence is this persuasive. I just picked out the most persuasive things. But those but... are like pretty Those are pretty strong. At least I wanna I wanna believe this so I bad do too. Now. I already do. That would just <laughs> on make board. it all the more. Yeah, I guess it is circumstantial, but like it's it's so it's a good. lot of circumstances. Yeah, that's sort of the that's strongest of... stuff I've got as far as convincing you that he's a spy. 
It feels very Crowley, though. It does. It's like very, parts like... parts of it, like, I don't know. This next... So we're, we're done with the First World War. Oh, okay. Sorry. Oh, you know, I've, I know it's... all of our listeners love to hear about World War One. Second one was pretty bad. Let's get to World War Two. So this story now, as we turn to World War Two, is a, is a little bit funkier. Um, oh. But it, it definitely shows that Crowley had contact with intelligence agencies even near the end of his life. So on the 10th of May, 1941, Rudolf Hess left Augsburg, Germany, in a Messerschmitt BF 110D plane and was shot down, flying over Scotland, and parachuted safely to the ground. A newsreel would later portray him as being apprehended by a farmer carrying a pitchfork. Hess had first heard Hitler speak in July of 1920, and became the 16th member of the Nazi party. Why is this guy's name? I feel like his yeah, name is very familiar. Yeah. I think maybe... He's a famous Nazi man. He participated in Hitler's attempt to overthrow the government. It's called the Beer Hall Putsch. And in 1923, oh, I like that. Yeah, but it was terrible. It was the Nazis no, doing the Nazi things. No, but the name is really nice. right. it's a catchy name. In 1923, he became Hitler's personal secretary in prison, where he was the guy who took dictation for Hitler's Nazi tract Mein Kampf. Oh. He became a leading figure in the party, and Hitler named him second in succession after the start of World War II, although his title of Deputy Führer was largely ceremonial. Mm -hmm. His mysterious flight took place at the height of the conflict between Germany and Britain. So it's not like the Germans were on the down, like they were, they were not on a downward spiral here. The Germans had a good chance of winning the war when Hess just got in a plane and got the heck out of Germany and parachuted into Scotland. Why did he leave? That's what we're going to find out. Oh, oh, okay. Sources suggest that he believed Russia was the Nazis' primary enemy, and involving the British in the war would only distract the Germans from their true objective, and perhaps compromise their nascent empire. Spoiler alert, he's kind of right. Fighting a war on two fronts brought Hitler down. He foresaw that, and he probably foresaw that because he's way into astrology. He was oh, also apparently... Astrology? It's coming, yeah. He was also apparently in bad mental health, though. Yeah, I mean, sounds right. He was part of the Nazi party. Yeah, he spilled a lot of uh, arcane symbolic terms and ideas during his subsequent interrogation by British brigadier and sometime astrologer Roy Firebrace. Whoa. Well, of course he's involved with astrology. Well, we got an astrologer in part because an astrologer could speak his bizarre language of symbols and things. That is the Fire name race. of only a wizard. Right? Like For Roy Firebrace. That's <laughs> or a D and D character. Like it's yeah. one or the yeah. other. <laughs> In his article for Seven Ages, the journalist Micah Hanks points out that many Nazis had a passion for astrology, particularly Rudolf Hess. Hess had his own personal astrology in Ernst Schultestrathaus, and Hitler held Schultestrathaus at least partially responsible for Hess Hess's ill-conceived flight, arresting the astrologer after Hess had been captured. Ian Fleming... Remember, we mentioned him at the beginning? Yeah. yeah. Famed writer of the James Bond series and an intelligence officer during the Second World War, had heard in advance through his contacts in Germany about Hess's flight. So he knew that Hess was going to take this flight before he even got in a plane. Britain's Prime Minister, Winston Churchill, was entirely opposed to any sort of peace deal with the Germans, but Fleming had attempted to send word through his contacts to Hess of a false coup to replace Churchill with a more peaceably inclined leader. So he sent this false flag to try to get Hess to make the trip. No, we're willing to deal, even though Churchill was never going to make a deal. When Hess didn't bite, Fleming decided to take advantage of his penchant for astrology by sending false astrological charts his way Yo. to convince him that the time was ripe to make a deal. Yeah, Fleming does not mess around. That would does. be like if Jacob texted me and was like, hey, on my astrology, like my natal chart, like what's happening next week? And I was just like... You're... You should probably serve me cookies. Yeah, like <laughs> all you of will, the days. You are forever Bow down to the Scorpio. <laughs> like, yeah, like that's, that's so rude. If you want to live, there'll be cookies on my doorstep. Because <laughs> your Jupiter is it? Never. Stulte. Oh, I got to do this again. Stulte Strathaus, Hess's personal astrologer, swore that he'd had no role in persuading Hess to make the trip, despite the fact that Hitler and his deputies were convinced astrology had played a role in the flight. So much so 
the, the astrologer was arrested along with many more Nazis circulating around the Nazi administration. And so it actually stands to reason that Ian Fleming's British astrology charts could have gotten into Hess's hands. So all we needed to do to t just end the war was to just send everyone fake astrology reports. Yes. More wow. or less. Yep. We should mm. learn from our mistakes, America. From now you on, think we should we just would. do that. Send out fake astrology reports mm. to any of our enemies. Someone... Email Trump. Where's <laughs> We can fix this whole North Korea thing right now. Yeah. Rumors hmm. have circulated that a part of this occult astrological warfare involved, of course, our man, Aleister Crowley. Only days after Britain entered the war, Crowley contacted the Naval Intelligence Division to complete form. Fill out his forms. Uh -oh. Two days later, it's British. <laughs> we were British both form. very confused. I was like, a complete form? What's his complete, what's his form? complete form? We have some British listeners who are like, oh yeah, complete form. But... It's like, what's his final form? <laughs> like, <laughs> final evolution. Yeah. Dead. Uh, two days later, he received a personal reply from Admiral Godfrey, Ian Fleming's boss, summoning Aleister Crowley for an interview. Fleming was then given charge of all, quote unquote, Crowley business. <laughs> he needed his own babysitter. Yeah, he's like, yeah. He was the author of James Bond. Uh, yeah. uh, so, uh, Amado Crowley is a guy we've never talked about. He claimed to be Aleister Crowley's illegitimate son and also claimed to be his protege. I have, I have to look into this guy and see if there's more to be said about him than this, but I'll just tell a little story about him today. So, this was a fun story he told. He said uh, that there was a ritual that Crowley performed with Fleming and also this guy called Maxwell Knight, another guy in British intelligence. Um, and he was the, Maxwell Knight was actually the prototype for Ian Fleming's character M, the bo J James Bond's boss in the office. Oh, okay. They all just sound like D&D &D characters, all of their names. <laughs> <laughs> uh, anyway, they performed this secret ritual, the three of these guys, M, Ian Fleming, and Aleister Crowley at Ashdown Forest. They dressed an effigy like Rudolf Hess and attempted to magically invoke him oh. to get him to make the trip. Okay. But <laughs> Amado Crowley's a lot like his, his supposed illegitimate dad. Uh, there's no supporting evidence for this <laughs> claim, <laughs> including course. from Aleister Crowley himself. Yeah. Okay, still, Crowley may well have been involved in fooling Hess astrologically and may have even engaged him in a secret interrogation at an MI5 facility sometime between his first interrogation with your man Firebrace and his confinement to a mental hospital in Wales in June 1942. Four days after Hess's capture, Crowley had written to Fleming the following. If it is true that Air Hess is much influenced by astrology and magic, my services might be of use to the department in case he should not be willing to do what you wish. Was James Bond based on Aleister Crowley? Yes. They both did sleep with a lot of women. Mm. Aleister Crowley liked his martinis shaken and not stir and stirred full because of, like, opium and yeah, hashish. Yeah, yeah, no, I was about to say because you have to mix the potion before you consume. He liked his <laughs> martinis made of hashish and smoked. Yes. yes. Yeah. After the war, Hess was tried at Nuremberg along with other Nazi leaders, but he escaped the death penalty as a result of his Scotland flight. He simply hadn't been around when Hitler and his commanders committed their worst atrocities. Oh my god. A kind of a lucky break. He was sentenced to life imprisonment and spent 41 years at Spandau Prison. This is a fascinating story, actually. The facility had been set aside by the British to house the Nazi war criminals and ended up holding only seven people. The others housed there had shorter sentences or were released for ill health, and Hess ended up spending... 21 years at Spandau as its only prisoner, the most expensive prisoner in the world. Hess, whose only companion had been his warden, Eugene K. Byrd, hung himself with an electric cord in 1987. Wait, the, who, he did or the Hess guard? Did. Oh, no. oh, I thought he forced the guard to The guard hang actually himself. wrote a book about this, so if you look up Eugene K. Byrd, if you want to read more about this, he wrote an entire book about his experience with the loneliest and most That's expensive prince of, uh, prisoner on earth. Crazy. That's so weird. Just the only person. He was 93, prison. by the way, when he hung himself with that electric cord. He's 93 years old. How'd he, how'd he get up there? That's what I was thinking. <laughs> he had Eugene to it, you know? Oh. Yeah, I don't know, man. Oof. Later that year, the British demolished the prison to prevent it from becoming a Nazi shrine. The spot was transformed into a parking lot and then a shopping center 
and all the building materials from the demolition were ground up and tossed into the North Sea. Oh my I'm just, god. Wow. I'm just envisioning a bunch of Nazis worshipping in a parking lot. <laughs> yeah. Like it does not stop them. It becomes the a shopping, shopping mall. mall. And they're just like in it. Just in like, Victoria's Secret. Just yeah. conducting a ritual. Yeah. Huh? <laughs> using like using the mannequins as idols. Like. <laughs> Trying to hoist the swastika. Yeah. <laughs> the, gr- the bra girl keeps <laughs> taking it down. Yeah. Get out of here. <laughs> So, uh, isn't that wild, though, that ritual That's that the British ultimately ended up insane. observing? The only thing they preserved was a single set of keys, which are currently kept at a military museum at Berwick Barracks in Berwick-upon-Tweed. Is that just because they didn't want it to... Well, no, they could have taken it down and not have disposed <laughs> like of it that way. They didn't have way. to dump it, like... The like, British were crazy. hardcore about purging the Nazis. It was pretty metal. It was a pretty metal way to dispose of an entire prison. <laughs> yeah, yeah, there you go. <laughs> Is that good for the the water, though? It's just bricks. It was okay. a while ago. It's fine. All right. Hess wasn't Crowley's only interest, though, in the Second World War. According to Spence, in 1942, he proposed Plan 241 to his student, Robert Cecil, who was then working in the Foreign Office. Crowley's plan involved recruiting homicidal and suicidal men persuading them to kill Germans and then kill themselves and leave the number 241 on the corpses. What? That is... Crowley argued that this would inspire copycat attacks by similarly desperate individuals and spread panic among the Germans. Like it would, right? If there are all these corpses with the number 241 on them. That would freak you out. What's why I'm laughing, why this is so funny is because it just feels like something that might be real. Like, well, it was never followed through. No, but I feel like that could have been a discussion that Crowley was a it part of. It just reminds me. This is really stupid of the movie uh, Tucker and Dale versus Evil. All the college students accidentally killing themselves and trying to kill each other. The whole movie. Did they put numbers on themselves. No, but <laughs> <laughs> the random like suicide thing like mass just like grabbing like all these people to just be like here you go yeah. do this really creepy ass stuff like what what 241 was just the name of the mission uh, crowley you know he's all into you know Number. all these yeah. which is why things, again so. i'm like that just feels but like how did he expect to just find these people like hey he's suicidal and homicidal <laughs> you're perfect come join me yeah that like, was really the legwork that he wasn't <laughs> right? trying to think through find all the suicidal germans right he put which, in an ad next to the, the time. lusitania <laughs> yeah. <laughs> yeah anyone who boarded the lusitania that's who he found out who i mean was at suicidal. the time it probably wasn't that hard to find suicidal germans Anyway, that's the last <laughs> link in uh, Crowley and the spookier side of the World Wars, Plan 241. That brings us to our conclusion here. So what do we think? What's our votes? Was Crowley a spy? Yes, yes, yes. or no? Yes. <laughs> Strong yeses here. You convinced? That's quick. I don't know. Like, uh, I feel like I'm as convinced as I possibly could be. Yeah. Without I'm pretty con- actual I gotta say, I'm evidence. I'm pretty convinced. Yeah. It just feels convinced. like some of the things you were describing, I was like, that sounds right. So when we actually go back and look at most of Crowley's career, it's, what Spence does is he tries to reinterpret a lot of the crazy, horrible things he did as actually acts in service of, hmm. yeah, yeah, being a secret I feel like agent. That's pretty controversial. It is, yeah. Considering it, yeah. Even when I say that I love Crowley, I get <laughs> a lot it of puts why a though. Spin. <laughs> I, I mean, I'm, I'm always like middle of the road, right? So I, I think that probably he was doing some secret servicey things, secret agenty things for the British. Mm. Um, but sometimes he was just yeah. Being Crowley. As I say, I don't think it was necessarily like all of it because no, you know Crowley yeah. being Cro- Crowley being Crowley. You made me say Crowley. Ah. It's weird. I don't believe that, but you said it, so I said it. I just want to put him like in the Kingsman. And have him have all those, like, cool gadgets. Well, like... <sighs> his cool gadget was his mouth. Mm. Yeah. That's also, what never they mind. called it. <laughs> I'm not going to say gadget. the other thing. <laughs> Let's but get to the, uh, what? I, I don't know. I just feel like he overplays a lot of stuff. And I yeah. feel like some of it was definitely, like, okay, but, like, That's the whole him, him so being tricky. responsible for the ship sinking, like, all right. <laughs> That is a lot. That's a lot. <laughs> but he could have been involved. Yeah. He could have desired it as an outcome and make it some... He's such a sneaky kind of sure. guy. Yeah. yeah. I feel like he would sneak in and out of events like that. Sneaky. You know? Yeah. Yeah. Let's get to our order of confessors. Uh, let's bring over uh, Shannon Landers. This is our order of confessors. Shannon is our official Instaquisitor, master of the Instagrams. 
Master <laughs> of the Inst. Oh, I'm sorry. Oh, that's okay. Hi, guys. It's also, Thank you for uh, the little intro song. Well, I was, summertime. I, do, uh, I feel honored. <laughs> so I am. I mean, it's not. It's not summertime seasonally, but uh, as your uh, as a professor, I am in my summer break, as are many of you. Yes. I thought you were going to say in your summer shorts. That's what so I, I, I am also in my summer, <laughs> summer shorts, shorts, that's true. Uh, Shannon can take a picture for everyone for later. Oh, uh, yeah. but oh wow. <laughs> my, my baby Corinne is with us, so Shannon is taking on the role of uh, watching Corinne while we podcast, because since it's summertime, I am full-time daddy daycare. <laughs> TM. <laughs> no, I'm not I'm not accepting any more registrations here. It's oh. one baby daycare. No, I think the movie Solo is TM. Yeah, we said that. Oh, the main the movie. <laughs> <laughs> All right, so Instaquisitor, what is going on in the land of Instagram? Um, there's not much, but I think something that's worth mentioning is that you know, a bunch of us just graduated. Yeah, you and Jacob. Last week from Chesapeake. Nick, Sam. And yeah. Yeah, it's, those are our professors, it. right? So we just had a bunch of, oh, confessors. Our actors, alchemical actors. Alchemical actors, yeah. 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 So it was just really exciting. And and you put a post up on uh, the Occult Confessions page, and a bunch of our listeners uh, were very kind about that. Yeah, we had some people mention saying congratulations. Uh, and we want to thank uh, someone who gave us a review. So now, at our, our last episode... Oh, this is it. I mean, this is the first one that we've gotten. It is a direct response to my plea for reviews. Yep. <laughs> so... Uh, I gave a, a long and impassioned speech about how, how we could really use folks to write some, some nice reviews for us on iTunes and wherever you're listening. And Austin C7G uh, f- followed it to the letter. Exactly. So to the letter. <laughs> Olivia had tossed in the idea that you, you just write A+. That's so it. So Austin begins with A+. Uh, and I said, all you have to do is say something, something simple like, love it. And Austin says, love it. And he goes on to say that he looks forward to listening to the episodes. But Austin, you're the best. You appeased both Rob and I in yeah. one post. Do you know how hard that is to do? It's, it's impossible. Very difficult. It's exactly what we were looking for. Exactly. <laughs> <laughs> All right. I think that uh, that brings us to uh, the end of our order of confessors here. Olivia, bring us on home. I hereby adjourn and declare closed the se- oh, this meeting of the secret order of alchemical actors till such a time as we get together and do it again. Your baby distracted me. Oh, Corinne. She's being so good right now. She's just I know. staring She's at so John. Cute, right? uh, but you, guys, are, you guys might have heard her earlier in the episode. I'm not sure. Yeah. I might not be able to clip out all the baby noises in the her background. Approval. Her approval. And disapproval. Her feelings about Alistair Crowley. Uh, so, uh, today's episode, we had Nick Ross did the voice of the German embassy and jacob wheatley came in to play alistair crowley again for us that's his third episode in the role of crowley may he reign (laughs) joining us around the circle we had john cook our sylph of the air hello and uh, goodbye we had brianna literal metallic metallurgic prophet metallurgic prophet i'm glad you remember because yeah it's still a big one we don't have a, do we have a keeper of the names? We still don't have a keeper of the titles. Yeah, so we are hunting, that one. we are actively see. I've posted on Indeed.com, I'm looking. <laughs> <laughs> I haven't really, don't look for that job, don't apply no. for that job. Uh, although, if you want to write a mock job application for keeper of the titles, I... We will accept We will. Always willing to be amused. Yeah. And Olivia Literal, our grandmaster. Let me know if you prefer Crowley or whatever Rob says. Crow- while we're still on this debate... It's, I it's will die on this debate. My name is Rob C. Thompson. I am our supreme hierophant. We record at Chesapeake College at the Cadby Theater on Maryland's scenic eastern shore, where Ian Fleming spent his summers. Ooh, ah. Or something. Winters. Mm. Some yeah. part of a time. He has like a vacation house yeah. or something. On the bay. Uh, so, uh, coming up next. Coming up next. The Magical Battle of Britain going to be going into the career of Dion Fortune and how she used the power of magic and Arthurian legend and Jesus to repel the Nazis from Britain's shores. I don't even know where to begin with that, but I'm excited about it. Yeah. I'll have your beginning if you have my end. <laughs> Sounds Always. so stoic. Deal. Is that well, like on some merch? Like, catch yeah. you next. Okay, I guess we'll get on that. Catch you next time here on Occult Confessions. <laughs> <laughs>